Okay, so in this video we're going to review periodic trends. So when we're talking about periodic trends, it's very important for you to remember the trend, but anytime that we explain it, anytime it's included in a multiple choice question, they're going to expect you to understand the underlying principles, not just the trend. So let's start with uh, the atomic radius. So atomic radius is basically just the size. Atoms will get larger going to the left of the periodic table and down. And it's pretty much one of the only trends that goes in that direction. So as we go in this direction of the periodic table, uh, we'll have larger atoms. Okay, so as you go to the right, um, atoms will get smaller because the protons are increasing. So as we go this way, um, I'm going to increase my number of protons, which means that the electrons are going to be more attracted to that nucleus and be pulled in closer to it, which makes it a smaller atom. Uh, now as you go down, the atoms are going to get larger because yes, the protons are increasing, but you're also adding energy levels. When you do that, you're, you're adding more electrons on the inner energy levels. And what happens is something called shielding. Those extra electrons in the inner energy levels will shield the outside electrons from feeling the pull of the nucleus as much. So they're not going to be as attracted, so they're a little bit further away. Okay, so shielding only happens when you add electrons to the inner energy level. Okay, so the effective nuclear charge is the charge that the electron actually experiences. So it's the number of protons that we have minus how much shielding is going on. So the effective nuclear charge is basically the force of attraction that the electrons actually experience after you account for the repulsions of the other electrons. So anytime that we're explaining these trends, yeah, it's good to know in what direction the size increases, but you have to be able to explain the shielding impact and also the effective nuclear charge. So as we go um, to the right, we're increasing our nuclear charge because we're increasing the number of protons, which pulls the electrons in closer. Um, as I go down, I have more and more energy levels, which means I have more shielding. Those extra electrons are repelling the outside electrons away from the nucleus. So you have to make sure you can explain those two um, forces. Okay, so ion size. Well, cations, cations are positive, and that's because we remove electrons. So if we remove electrons, it becomes smaller. This is because less electrons means we have less repulsions. So if I get rid of some of those electrons, um, I have less repulsions, so those electrons get pulled in closer. So basically, our effective nuclear charge increases. Now, if we have anions, those will be larger. Anions are negative, which means I have added electrons. And if I've done that, I've got more repulsions. So those extra electrons are repelling the electrons away from the nucleus. So the electrons are located further away. And then we would say that the effective nuclear charge decreases. So remember, effective nuclear charge is how much force of attraction the electrons actually experience from the nucleus after we account for the repulsions. Okay, so ionization energy is the amount of energy necessary to remove one electron. That's usually measured in kilojoules per mole. And if we were writing out the equation, we would write it like this. So it's important to remember this. And whenever we write out the equation, it's one mole of that substance, and it has to be gaseous. So let's say that I was doing this for magnesium. Okay, so magnesium as a gas, if I remove an electron, just one electron, 
becomes positive. So remember, if you remove an electron, it becomes positive. And it becomes the gaseous ion. And then I'm going to add the electron on this side. So if I were adding an electron, it would be the reverse. Okay, the second ionization energy is the energy required to remove the next electron. So if I were doing that for this, I would start off with a positive one because the second electron means that I've already removed um, the first one. Okay, so if I remove another electron, it becomes even more positive. So it's not going to be positive one anymore, it'll be positive two. And then I add that at one electron. So they might have questions where they ask you to write out these uh, reactions. So if you remove an electron, it becomes positive. It has to be one mole and it has to be gaseous. Okay, so the trend of ionization energy is that it increases going up and to the right. So it increases like this. Basically, uh, the smaller your atom is, the harder it is to remove an electron. And that makes sense because those electrons are closer to the nucleus. So if we're trying to remove that electron that's closer to the nucleus, it's going to be harder. It's going to require more energy. So as I go, but you cannot say that it's because it's smaller. You have to use this as your explanation. So as you go to the right, your nuclear charge increases. Okay? Yes, that does pull the electrons in closer. Okay? So your nuclear charge increases, which means that those electrons are harder to remove. Um, shielding is not going to increase going to the right because we're not opening up energy levels. All right, so um, as I go up, I have less shielding. So if I were to go down a group, I'm adding in energy levels, which is adding more shielding which makes it easier to remove those electrons. Okay, so um, this is the most typical example of what you might see for a question. So you have data, okay? And basically this is um, very similar to looking at a PES. So when I look at this, this is the amount of energy required to remove the first electron, the second, the third electron, the fourth, and so on. So if I have large jumps, so if I have a large jump that indicates that an electron was lost from an energy level that's closer to the nucleus. Okay, so let's look at these numbers here and let's find the biggest jump. Okay, so I have 540 and 1651. And it goes up by another thousand and then right here it goes up to 15,000 almost. So it went from 3,000 here, almost 3,000, to 15,000. Well I would say that's a rather large jump. So there's a huge jump in energy between the fourth and the third or the third and the fourth electron. So it requires a lot more energy to remove this one and what that indicates is that I've probably removed an electron at this point that's closer to the nucleus. So let's look at a periodic table. Okay, so basically after I remove three electrons it becomes very hard to remove the next one. So if I'm looking at this right here, well the ones that like to lose three electrons are in group 3A. Aluminum likes to lose three electrons. Well, once I go to remove another electron, um, so let's look at aluminum really quick. If I look at the configuration, it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p1. Well, if I remove this one, then I would have these two left in the uh, third energy level. So if it becomes positive three, this is the new electron configuration. Well, 
if I'm trying to remove another electron after those three, I'm at a new energy level, and those electrons are going to be much closer to the nucleus, they're going to be harder to remove. So it's probably in group 3A. I can't be sure which one it is, but it's probably in this group at least. Okay, so if I were looking at, let's say, magnesium. Well, here's magnesium right here. If I were going to be looking at the same data, I should see a huge jump in energy after two electrons are removed because it's a positive two charge. So it's going to be easier to remove those two electrons than to remove the third because once I remove two electrons, and this is what I'm going to have. 3s2. This is what it normally is. Well, if I remove two electrons, this is what I have. So now I'm at a lower energy level. These electrons are located closer to the nucleus with less shielding, so those are going to be harder to remove. Now, if I were looking at sodium, sodium is normally a positive one. So I should see a huge jump in energy after removing that first electron. So its normal configuration is this. S2, 2s2, 2p, 6, 3s1. Well, after I remove that, then I should see a huge jump in energy. So it should be much easier to remove this one than to remove the next one. So basically, if you're given this data, look at the charges. So group 1 wants to lose just one electron. Group 2 wants to lose two electrons. So in group 2, you should see a huge jump in energy from the second to the third energy, uh, electron. If I'm in group three, I should see a huge jump in energy from the third to the fourth. So a possible choice would be anything in group 3A for this. Um, you might also see discrepancies in this trend. And then that can be observed with like a half-filled sublevel. So let's look uh, between nitrogen and oxygen. Well, the trend says that oxygen should have a higher ionization energy than nitrogen because it's more towards the right. But that's actually not what's seen, and that's because of its configuration. So nitrogen is this, 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. Oxygen is this. Well, when you look at the orbital diagram, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see, for this one, it'll look like this. For nitrogen, it should be this. But if I have one more electron, it'll look like this. Well, actually, because they're forced to be in the same orbital, there's actually a little bit of repulsion because they're in the same space. So it's actually a little bit easier to remove that electron than to remove this one. So. Those are some discrepancies that you might see in data, and they might ask you to explain that. But no matter what, since we're talking about periodic trends, you're always going to refer to the repulsions the electrons have for each other and the attraction they feel for the nucleus every time you explain any of these trends. Okay, so electron affinity is the opposite of ionization energy. So electron affinity is when you add an electron. So it's the energy change when one electron is added. Sometimes energy is required. Sometimes it's actually released in this. So the first electron affinity is the energy change when the first electron is added. And this is what it'll look like. So if I could have bromine as a gas, I'm gonna add an electron to that and that produces a negative charge. So if we add electrons, it becomes negative. But when I do this, it should be one mole, and then it should also be gaseous. The second configuration, or the second electron affinity, um, is going to be when I add the second electron. So I could have sulfur, but with a negative one charge, because we're adding the second electron and it becomes more negative, so 2 minus. Okay, so uh, the electron affinity can be positive or negative, meaning 
it might take energy to add an electron or it might release energy. Okay, so nonmetals tend to accept electrons much more readily, so their electron affinity is usually negative, so they will release energy. Metals usually lose electrons, so the electron affinity is usually positive because it's really hard to add an electron to a metal. All right, so electronegativity is the ability of the atom to attract electrons when it's bonding. It increases up and to the right, as most of your trends do, but fluorine is most electronegative. Uh, we don't include the noble gases because they usually don't make bonds. So electronegativity is the ability of the atom to pull the electrons towards themselves when we bond. Um, this is something that you should just know. Um, so if you take a metal oxide and you put it into water, it's going to make a hydroxide. So if I have magnesium oxide, I put it into water. Now I'm adding it to water, I'm reacting it. It's going to add, make magnesium hydroxide. Okay, this is not the same thing as dissolving something into water. Okay, this is an actual reaction right here. So if I take a metal oxide and put it into water, I'm going to make a hydroxide. So metal oxides are actually basic. Non-metal oxides, though, are acidic because I could take it, my carbon dioxide, that's a non-metal oxide, I put it into water, I can make carbonic acid. Okay, and again, this is not the same thing as dissolving something into water, okay? Keep that in mind. 